just going to open it up because we have about 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. So I will call on people and then you direct your question to where <coughs> it is that you uh, would like to address it to any of the panelists. So um, hands. Solomon? Yeah, um, I guess this is a question for Lord just about the scope of the book. So since you said a frame is being very much, oh, you want me to come in? Uh, you just check it. Just talk up. Okay, so you frame the book very much in being in this sort of contemporary global justice literature. Do you think it has anything to say to maybe people who have a slightly, you know, more classical, like, you know, maybe communitarian view of, of what justice is? I'm thinking, you know, there's the discussion in book two of the Republic, right, of the just state. And the interesting thing, of course, is he begins by saying, well, the just state is a bunch of people living happily in community. And God kind of objects, okay, that's a city of pigs. So he says, ah, you don't want a just state, you want a luxurious state. And if you have that view of justice, do you have anything to say about that? Or would they object that maybe you're just talking about the merely global luxurious state? Uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned, the uh, bigger the audience, the better. Communitarians, nine-year-olds doing corporate <laughs> work. And they're very hard to speak for you know, who might find this of some interest. But uh, it doesn't uh, presuppose a certain party line. I hope it doesn't. At some places, we say, look, we can't argue back to first principles on everything. But uh, sure, I think the communitarians are worth talking to. Thank you. I can, if I can exercise my prerogative here, I, I have a question. When have you not? It's, it's, <laughs> it goes to all three of you, actually. But uh, uh, so, uh, but um, what if the if the empirical evidence cut a different way? How would that impact your argument um, in here? So let's say that uh, you know the way even uh, so Michael was was giving a very uh, telling uh, illustration. Right, um, but what if the consequences of the migration patterns were uh, devastating to the the other group here? Would that change the argument or not? And the reason why I ask that is because sometimes people make an argument about migration going that way, and it does appear to be you know, a debate over, you know, what happens with the cultural. Say, like, say that you're debating with uh, Borjas or something, right? And, and so it's not an issue of rights in that sense. It's a sense of the consequences of what happens with the migration patterns, I'd say. So how would you deal with that if leaving people alone ended up with uh, consequences that didn't cut in the way that we would want them to? I'll get that for you. Unless you'd like to. Uh, so so one thing that I didn't mention uh, which, which to me was uh, one of the 50 fascinating things in the book, is that it, it is not a case for open borders in the sense of completely unregulated movement of people. Uh, in particular, they uh, express uh, serious concern about the potential for entrants to commit violent acts. And they argued that it is uh, legitimate and just to restrict people uh, who, an, on an individual basis, are, are uh, suspected to be a, a violent threat. N and not just that, but that the standard that is applied should be uh, lower than the, the conservative court standard of in innocent until proven guilty, that the, the justice allows some latitude for individual exclusion on, on that margin. Um, I, so, so, uh, so, so that's the one thing I wanted to clarify. And, and as for whenever one is talking about uh, this issue, the, the, the a slippery slope to uh, God knows what disaster always comes up. And as I was reading uh, Scott versus Sanford, 1857, uh, for, uh, uh, preparing for this, I, I found this uh, delicious passage in which the, the writer of the majority opinion is talking about the slippery slope of, of what would happen if we gave citizenship to all of these people of African descent. Quote, it would give to persons of the Negro race the right to enter every state whenever they pleased, to sojourn there as long as they pleased, to go where they pleased, 
the full liberty of speech in public and in private upon all subjects upon which its own citizens may speak, to hold public meetings in political affairs, and to keep and bear arms wherever they want. Uh, obviously, uh, a, a horrifying scenario uh, that pretty much describes what we have today. Um, and statements like that, thousands of statements like that, make me suspicious of the, of the slippery slopes of the world. When, whenever a, a, a person in Great Britain talks to me about what might happen to their culture if people move there, uh, I ask them if they can read Beowulf uh, in the original, <laughs> which I can't. It was written in the ninth century. I can make out about a word per page, but I can read Chaucer about five, four or five hundred years later, and the only reason I can do that is because the language has been hopelessly corrupted by French by that time, giving us uh, a language I can understand, giving us Shakespeare, etc. Uh, I, uh, I'm not sure how it is logically coherent uh, for somebody who is such a beneficiary of cultural bastardization to be uh, uh, so suspicious of it. And perhaps we should, be, we should be suspicious of those who assert that cultural change brings disaster. Just, just to push back on that, I, just so you know where I'm coming from, I, I'm basically an open borders person. That's, that's where my commitments are. But I'm also interested in this empirical issue. And, I, and there probably are people who would care about preserving a culture, which I think is a fool's errand. But then there are people, I think Thomas Sowell is someone who is of this opinion, I'm not sure, but there are cultural qualities that are conducive to the maintenance of liberal institutions. And so, could there be a rate, an extent of migration of people with non-liberal values that could overwhelm and undermine the broader picture of liberty that I think you're, you want to maintain? So it, not so much, I mean, you know, the French came in, they enslaved the locals, they killed a lot of them, they took their land, and they established feudalism, and it was really bad for a lot of people for several hundred years. So not so much that the language changed or that the literature changed, but that there was real suffering by real individuals for a period of time. So can you comment maybe from, from that point of view? Th this is in the book, so if you'd like to, this exact issue. Uh, I wouldn't think that the Norman invasion is a paradigm of libertarian uh, <laughs> politics and <laughs> operation. Uh, but uh, uh, let me bring it a little bit closer to uh, today. Uh, change of culture is, I think, pretty innocuous, frankly, because culture changes kind of, you know, I'm pissed off that I can't use any of the apps my students use, so that culture has left me behind. Sometimes, you know, sometimes they tell me they'll show me how to take selfies, but <laughs> then I see what it looks like and I think better left alone. But, um, but you were talking about not just change of coat, but bad stuff happening. And of course we you know we were all titillated by the news that one of the what well, was it eight uh, eight murderers who uh, Credit the carnage in, in Paris uh, was a pseudo refugee from Syria. Big news, and so our candidates pontificated about that. The much more interesting factor is what? Seven that weren't. Seven that weren't. Yeah, but these are people who were settled in part of the. And yet, and yet, um, they made even William the Conqueror's boys seem gentle in comparison. I think there's a real issue here. The conditions for maintaining civility. Not reading Beowulf, although I used to do when I was a nine-year-old doing book reports. But, uh, <laughs> but in terms of the conditions in which we can live peaceably, um, I mean, as far as I can how, well, Pete's going to tell me that economists have worked out the model for this, but this seems to me to be uh, one of the great unsolved problems. 
as we keep working at it. Sometimes I think you know, make progress, but I take an awful lot of regress too, especially every four years. Michael? Unless you want to say something, Please. just uh, briefly, you know, the, the uniquely horrifying thing about HIV is that it attacks the very cells which make an immune response, so there's something especially pernicious about it, and I, I, I can imagine uh, hypothetically legitimate migration restrictions in order for, for, for a liberal order to prevent its own uh, destruction. But uh, given, the, uh, given that it is an extreme understatement to say that that case has been argued for countless groups, including a group that Thomas Sowell belongs to <laughs> uh, in the past. Economists? Uh, <laughs> Yes, actually. You know, they're already inside the game. In many departments, in certain disciplines, yes. Uh, uh, and, and, and at least one other group and maybe more, uh, we, we, should really place, oh, yeah. we should place the burden of proof uh, on, you know, the, the, the way that this has escaped in, in uh, Paul Collier's book, Exodus, is that he just says, well, you know, migration is irreversible, so we should stop it right now just in case that happens. That is just uh, giving up the entire tradition of marginal analysis in economics and, and saying, well, if there might be a margin someday on which it happened. And I think that's insufficient given the many, 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 many times that insider groups have cried wolf. Uh, and we should wait until there's substantial evidence that our institutions are going away. Uh, the, the court in Sanford, uh, in, in, in Scott versus Sanford uh, was, was certain that the, the, the very institutions that underpin American society would be, would be erased by allowing even a limited number of people of African descent to, to, to uh, participate in it. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's so bizarre <laughs> that we should demand much, much more than, um, than the kind of uh, vacuous fear mongering that uh, Collier and others engage in. Well, actually, I think it's on the same line, though it's a question of clarification. I think, as a starting point, this distinction, or maybe the lack of a distinction between uh, economic migrants and uh, refugees, right? Uh, so it's not very clear what was your argument there. And I'm asking you this question because years ago I have taken a class with you on lifeboat ethics. Bowling Green University, 20 years or so ago. Now, that uh, lifeboat ethics class was exactly about profiles and typologies and their uses in various moral and political circumstances, creating lists, creating priorities, and setting up criteria that might be operational in different circumstances. So I'm not very sure how your thought has evolved from that initial lifeboat ethics approach to this I'm not very sure, lack of distinction between economic migrants and uh, refugees, including the moral and political implications of uh, those lack of uh, distinctions. Yeah, I'm not sure how well you did in that class. I'm going to test you. <laughs> <laughs> Just what was my position 20 years ago? <laughs> okay. okay. Let me, let me test you on that then. No, I'm testing you on that. <laughs> I'll ask you a question in clarification. Is he playing fair? Oh, you're an economist now. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, that's it. Uh, look, I'm uh, not sure what I might have said under the pressure of uh, very clever students in that class. So I'm going to punt on that, but I'll tell you what I think now. I think um, that uh, in my understanding of how the world should be, the case for economic migrants is actually much stronger than uh, refugees. And it's much stronger because economic migration involves voluntary transactions among people, say, who want to work or study or rent places so with others who want to do that, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, uh, the case, though, with refugees is, of course, that typically if you're running away from Assad or uh, 
or ISIS or such, you know, you're in a condition of desperation, you may be a drain on the resources of others rather than contributing to them. Uh, nonetheless, I think you'd have to, you know, either uh, uh, be uh, uh, very heartless or uh, have taken a lot of economics courses <laughs> not to feel some sympathy for those who are fleeing for their lives and such. Um, I would be entirely comfortable with support for uh, refugees and the like being, uh, being privatized. I think there are enough decent people who would be willing to support others. Uh, as indeed was done you know, throughout, uh, throughout so much of the history of this country and other places that accepted people coming in. But uh, 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 I, don't, I don't know if that suits you. Is that what I said 20 years ago? No, actually 20 years ago, I think that your position was clearer in terms of the criteria that we have to use in such circumstances. Who's the way? When you say we, we, I think we is the most uh, tricky word in policy, philosophical policy. Well, let's say for the, for the sake of this conversation, the two of us. The two of us, two of us. private me, citizens, me yep. and you. No? So uh, 20 years ago, the idea was that in such circumstances when we have limited resources, which is the lifeboat, yes, and we have a population that is larger than the carrying capacity, lifeboat, we have to make tough decisions. And in order to make those decisions, right, we have to build up a set of criteria in order to do that. Those criteria should be consistent. So in other words, when I'm creating two classes, economic migrants and refugees, I have to use, right, a consistent set of criteria in order to make a decision on a lifeboat situation. Now we may say that we are not in a lifeboat situation, and then you continue conversation from there. But if we use the extreme case of the light boat situation, it would be helping us to focus better the conversation. Now, in your uh, reply, I'm not very sure if I got the point, right? You said that there are two types of criteria. One of the set of criteria is operating for the economic migrants, and the other set of criteria is operating for the uh, refugees, the, the people that are running from war. And I agree with that. We could have a conversation in that direction if you want to. But that was not the point. Right? The point was to have a sort of unitary set of criteria for an extreme situation that would be helping us to get a better sense what is the set of moral principles or political principles or institutional design principles that we are using when discussing a very concrete and applied issue like one of borders and migration. Good. Uh, a, I don't think a lifeboat metaphor is helpful in this. I think it's positively misleading. Second, I'm going to guess it was Ray Fry, my colleague at Bowling Green, who actually gave that course, because I don't recall saying what you said. But third, that's what criteria. The primary one is non-interference. If uh, you want to hire somebody to, to watch your children or mow your grass or uh, or a manager stock portfolio, I don't think anybody else is entitled to, to intervene. You know, barring, we can all do the negative externality stars. I mean, you're economists, you can, you can figure out ways to tax height, for goodness sake. <laughs> that was a new one to me. Uh, thank God it isn't taxing weight, or I'd be really <laughs> proud of but, uh, uh, but, of course, in the case of refugees, it goes beyond that. It goes beyond simply non-interference, but positively helping. Should we do it? Yeah. But that's a further step. And I think that's probably all I have to say. Alex? Uh, so a question for Michael, and maybe Lauren wants to follow up, is that uh, justice at a distance seems to could be worked better in some societies than in others. So it seems that one of the problems with some of the European economies with uh, immigrants coming in is that they have such constrained labor markets uh, and perhaps also uh, invidious discrimination uh, to a greater extent than elsewhere that you manage to, in one society, have people uh, cut off 
uh, from the majority in that society, and uh, so develop uh, uh, a, uh, a, an external worldview while being within this, this society, and that's where a lot of these problems uh, come from. So the question is, what kind of institutions do we need uh, when not at a distance in order to best uh, uh, take advantage of and best integrate and, and best make justice at a distance possible? You mean with regard to individual mobility across borders? So if we have a lot of people coming in, that means in order to live with that, we're going to have to change internal institutions. What kind of internal institutions are going to best allow us to achieve justice at a distance? Okay. I think that was you. So th there's a fascinating part of the book that, that relates to this, where uh, they, they discuss the welfare state and, and uh, does does the welfare state uh, exacerbate uh, uh, nativism by giving people all kinds of reasons to exclude uh, because they, they create a necessary link between inclusion and expropriation? And uh, as, as I mentioned, I think there's some, you, you could discuss all kinds of policy remedies, but the, there is this core uh, question of whether certain domestic institutions allow mobility or don't. An analogy I, I often make is, you know, there were uh, coercive institutions to prevent female labor force entry. Um, not many people have ever heard the term marriage bar. I had never heard of it before a few uh, months ago, but Claudia Golden documents that in the 1920s and 30s, many white collar firms and school districts had explicit, often written policies of either not hiring or firing married women. Um, and you know, uh, it, it, uh, you could uh, imagine that the entry of women into the labor force caused some uh, non-zero harms. You could probably find a workplace rape that occurred only because women were allowed to work that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Uh, I, I hope nobody in this room would think that's a reason to coerce women not to work you might think it's a, a reason for education about sexual harassment or education about self-defense or uh, 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 many other norms and institutions that would allow mobility into the labor force rather than using that as a pretext to ban it. Uh, and I think it's very clear that the development of those institutions made uh, that particular kind of mobility possible. What, what I don't know and what I would like to know from Lauren is if this bears on, on the question of justice. That is, are we, because the question of the book is what do we owe to people who are poor and distant? Do, do we, do we, is it actually unjust to, so uh, a, a couple of fascinating papers by Leonard in the Journal of Economic Perspectives argues that the, the minimum wage was in part created as an exclusionary mechanism for migrants. Um, do we owe it? to the, the distant poor of the world to dismantle uh, uh, institutions like that to the extent that they block mobility? Uh, I, I don't have an answer to that, but I'll bet that Lauren does. Look, I'm not sure I'm qualified until two minutes ago. I thought marriage bar was where spouses went when they needed a drink <laughs> after you know what. So, uh, so this, this is the, see, I told you that I benefit more <laughs> when I come here than I provide, but um, uh, I, you know, my uh, first answer on this and several other questions is the default position should be non-interference. If you're suggesting that Europe involves far more interference in labor markets specifically, and other stuff too than the U.S. Is. I think that's right. Um, I think Germany has done brilliantly in this regard by sagaciously managing to get its uh, uh, its uh, population growth rate down to 1.5 or 1.6 per one, so that they have plenty of room for uh, bringing in. Yeah, I'm being. Sarcasm. I realize one shouldn't rely on humor in a room of economists, but uh, <laughs> but 
basically leaving people alone ought to be the first thing. And I thought we, I think we agreed on that. So like minimum wage, do we, who here really likes minimum wage? Want to go along, bring it up to 15, like uh, President, oh, she's not President yet, uh, <laughs> candidate Clinton. Well, you know, we're, I'm afraid, something of a minority. Is that going to harm lots of people who can least stand harm? Uh, yeah, it will. Is it liable to happen? Sure it will. Um, I can tell you a story about expressive voting, but I've taken too much time talking already. Okay, we're actually, unfortunately, uh, we're out of time here. I want to thank uh, each of the panelists and uh, Lauren for uh, coming here today and sharing their ideas. I'm sure that we have a lot of additional questions to ask. I would love to talk to Jesse about Rwanda and, Bos and uh, Bosnia and other kinds of things like that and, you know, what that entails in terms of when, like, for example, Roosevelt sent back uh, people into Holocaust Europe rather than accepting them into the United States and what's the moral, uh, you know, uh, sort of lesson from that as it relates to where we are today. Um, and, I, and, you know, and all these kind of questions. So I hope that uh, we continue this kind of conversation. But uh, please join me in, uh, you know, thanking our panelists.